Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. Uh, this is our first um, guest lecturer and our first visiting catalyst for the 4D design program. And I, yay! Um, and I am very, very excited to introduce Rob Walker. Um, Rob is a journalist who covers design, technology, business, the arts, and just in general how our material culture impacts uh, society and everyday life. And um, he's on the faculty of the Products of Design MFA program at SVA, which is a place where we intersected, although not where we first met. Um, Rob had been teaching a class, which I recently was um, a guest in, that was around developing point of view. And I thought this would be a fantastic way to kick off our 4D design program, um, instead of diving right into the geekery to actually make sure we have uh, a broad look and that students are developing their own voice, which is very much, of course, the DNA of Cranbrook. Um, Rob and I have known each other before. The first time we met, we, we were talking about, for the geeks in the audience, the Chumbi, which is a small electronic product. And um, Rob had been doing a piece for the consumed column for the New York, Time, New York Times, which he wrote for several years. Um, he has also contributed to uh, many other parts of the New York Times, Bloomberg Business Week, The Atlantic, NewYorker.com, Design Observer, The Organist, and um, tons of others. Um, he wrote the Workologist column from the Times for several years, the Consumed column, which I mentioned, um, and uh, was a contributing writer. Uh, his most recent book is The Art of Noticing, which we will be running a workshop around for the next um, two days. We do have a couple of open spots for anyone who might like to join us if you um, can make it at 10 a.m. tomorrow. And um, uh, in addition, there are many, many things that Rob has done, so I'm going to try not to take the mic for too long. But there's... Um, a particular project that I've also had my students riff on, which was the Significant Objects project, um, which was a book and a project around understanding the value that our uh, products have and how that value can be enhanced by narrative. Um, uh, he's also the author of Buying In, The Secret Dialogue Between What We Buy and Who We Are and Letters from New Orleans. And with that, I'm going to give the floor to Rob. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. That was lovely. Thank you, everybody, for coming out on this beautiful <laughs> evening. It's my first time in the Detroit area. Is it always this seductive? <laughs> uh, no, I really appreciate you having me here. And um, I'm going to talk about uh, the art of noticing stuff tonight. It does. It, it, it does come out, as, as will become apparent, it, it does, it, that this project d did kind of come out of the teaching of the um, point of view uh, class at, uh, at SVA. And uh, I forgot about the whole chumby thing. We'll have to have a separate, whole separate, because that's kind of thrown me off a little bit. Anyway, but so uh, let's get going. Um, the, the stuff I'm going to talk about tonight, the backdrop, I probably don't have to spend a tremendous amount of time convincing you that we live in a moment where there's a lot of, um, let's say, competition for your attention, uh, a lot of distraction out there. Uh, people talk about this all the time. It's a, it's a, we're, and it's, a, it's an old complaint, but we may be at like kind of peak, at peak, peak distraction or, you know, the, the peak of the attention panic or something. I don't know. Um, and I'm not here to complain about technology, though, which I think is the direction people mostly want to go in, but I think that, uh, What's going on now, this, this underlying sense of the fear of missing out, isn't a technologically invented thing. It's a human thing. And it's actually kind of a logical thing. There are good evolutionary solid reasons why you want to be aware of what's going on and what everyone else is paying attention to in your community or your tribe or however you want to put it. Um, the problem has become this, like, missing out on what? Because uh, now we live in a time where you know, you wake up and you check Twitter and find out which TikTok stars are having a feud. Like, do you need to know that? Is the, what are you missing out on exactly? And, um, and you do when your attention is taken up by those kinds of things. 
you do have to give up something and um, you lose track of, of something else. So for example, does anyone know right now what phase uh, the moon is in? Anybody? There's usually somebody. Someone to look it up on their phone before eventually. All right. It's waxing crescent. Did anyone guess that? So I find this interesting because there was a time when, you know, literally everyone on the planet knew what phase the moon was in all the time. And that's something that's been crowded out of our brain space. Douglas Rushkoff talks about this and recommends, uh, he's a writer who has been both pro and con technology in various ways, very smart, interesting thinker. Um, and uh, he has suggested keeping track of the moon as a way to sort of reconnect with the real world, the natural world, which I, I like the idea of that kind of thing. I'm very attracted to um, things that are, well, I'll put it this way. My frustration with the whole discussion about the attention panic is that uh, most of the remedies that people talk about are kind of negative. It's like put away your phone, throw away your phone, limit your time on your phone, limit your technology. It's all about sort of like being some kind of digit, like monk or something. It's not very positive. And I was more interested in like, well, what are fun things you could do that you could add to your life? And that's why I wrote ultimately this book, which is um, a series that my editor really hates the word assignment. So they're not assignments. It's a series of 131 provocations and prompts and games and ideas and fun things you can do to add to your life um, and to give yourself you know, fresh moments of uh, reflection and reconnection and rebuild those attention muscles. And there are 131 of them, so if we're gonna cover them all, I'm just kidding, I'm not gonna cover them all. No, I'm gonna talk about, about I'm gonna talk about 10, I think, uh, in the next 40 minutes or so. And, um, and then uh, we'll do questions if you want at the end. Um, and I'm gonna talk about uh, why this matters because it's, uh, it is an important skill to be able to uh, notice, to be able to pay attention to what you wanna pay attention to. It's something that really uh, matters for reasons that go beyond just uh, shaking off that feeling of distraction. Uh, I use a lot of examples in the book and in these exercises that were inspired by artists and uh, that's intentional. Artists are really good at noticing the things that everyone else overlooked or underrated in some way or another. And while that sounds like maybe a sort of esoteric skill, it's, it's not. It's really important, it's certainly important to design. Noticing what other people have missed is kind of the starting point of, uh, of design. I think it's important for being, um, I don't know, an entrepreneur. If you're wanting to start something new, then you need to notice an opportunity that, what, that other people have missed. I think it's important for a coach, a scientist, a manager. Um, almost anything that involves any veil or any, any vague sense of creativity or, there's just sort of no progress, there's no innovation without that core skill of being able to hone in on things that other people uh, missed. And that's what got me sort of excited about this project. Um, what drew me into it on a very personal level, um, this will be the first one that I mentioned, and I, I use this because this was my personal kind of like, what do you want to call it, uh, gateway drug exercise. Um, I was taking a trip to uh, San Francisco. This was five or six years ago. I'd been to San Francisco probably 10 times. I like it a lot. I, I don't want to say I'm over it. It's a beautiful city, but you know I've, I've, I'm past that sense of like a gog wonder of this new place and the architecture. Um, I wasn't going to have time to do any proper sightseeing. Uh, I was going to be running around a lot, and I wanted to give myself some kind of way of looking at that city that was kind of familiar to me in a novel and interesting way. And my one so I decided I'll look for one thing everywhere I go, and my one parameter is going to be that it has to be something. It has to be something that no one is trying to get me to look at. No one is trying to draw my attention to it. So um, what I settled on was not hot dogs or signs. It was um, security cameras. So everywhere I went, I took note of security cameras and where they were placed and why they were placed the way they were placed and I started to notice the kind of differences in the way that they lived in the world and how some security cameras 
you know, seem to want to be noticed, like this one, and um, how ineffective that was. This has actually been tagged. That's like a pretty, <laughs> a pretty bad outcome for a security camera. Uh, but some wanted to be hidden. They didn't want to be seen. Like, I don't think that these serve as deterrence to anybody. Um, and this picture is actually in New York because once I started doing this, I started seeing security cameras everywhere I went. And um, that trip to San Francisco was an eye opener for me on this. And I remember being at the airport at the, uh, at the end of the trip and calling my wife, and she knew I'd been taking these pictures. And I said, you know, the flight's leaving on time, everything, but uh, you know, I gotta tell you the security camera situation at the San Francisco airport is crazy, it's bananas, it's amazing. She said, Rob, please don't walk around the San Francisco airport taking pictures of all the security cameras, <laughs> which was good advice. Um, and, uh, you know, it became kind of a subject for me for a while. I started being aware of uh, writing about security camera projects. This was it for uh, something in uh, uh, the Netherlands, um, this group, Front 404, they, for George Orwell's birthday, they put um, uh, party hats on all the security cameras in town. And I became attracted to this idea of, you know, looking at things and trying to decode the city. Like this is another sort of things you can look for that no one's trying to get you to look for. Uh, another approach you can take is what needs to be explained or broken down or decoded. Um, a good example is this: uh, you've seen the, you see these sidewalk markings that sort of look like ancient runes or whatever but they're related to network infrastructure. And Ingrid Burrington did this terrific project where she made a guidebook showing people what all this stuff uh, meant. Um, another example, do people know what these are? Whoops, going too far there. Anybody? So these are graffiti buffs, meaning that there was graffiti right there, and um, in order to b uh, blot it out, just they were crudely overpainted with blotches of paint, which is an attempt to erase something from the urban environment, but it also adds something to the urban environment. And this photographer, Matthew Martin, saw these things as kind of accidentally beautiful in their own way, like as kind of works of art. So that's another thing you can do is take something that you know, is not intended for you to be really looking at it all. It's intended for you to, to prevent you from seeing something and reconceptualize it as something that's worth seeing. And we'll try one more audience participation thing here. So let's see, this is an online project. Does anyone know what's being documented here? Upside down ends is correct. Thank you. But typography is a fun, that's a little esoteric, although I think it's brilliant, but typography is a really fun and easy way to um, you know, do one of these exercises where you just sort of add something to your day of looking for a, typo, a particular type of typeface or a particular type of sign. Uh, we'll do one more. This is an a Australian artist, Michael Peterson. He's a terrific street artist who, uh, in this case, this is a great example of his work. As you can see, it's kind of a neglected area, some tall weeds. Uh, nothing much really going on there, but there's some kind of plaque or something going on. What is going on there? Oh, it's the Urban Weed Awards <laughs> for tallest weed. So there's another game you can play. You can pick something that's like seen as an irritant or at worst a boring thing and find the most superlative examples of it. So that's what kind of got me thinking about this whole process and this whole like how you can um, uh, do something besides look at your phone when you're wandering around a new place. Uh, the book starts out with visual stuff like that, with visually oriented exercises, because I think that we tend to uh, assume, when we talk about noticing, visual is the first thing we think of. But the book moves into another section where we get into dealing with other senses. Um, sounds are a favorite of mine. I have a friend who teaches at, uh, who teaches in San Francisco and who, he does a class. One of his um, assignments, he leads, first he leads students on a sound walk where they start in a kind of enclosed mall-like area and then they move through um, areas where there's a lot of uh, like sort of street noise, like l loud random street noise, traffic noise then the, a water fountain near the uh, 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 
Path uh, uh, BART station, um, and so on. And then he has them um, make their own uh, map of picking three sounds that they have discovered themselves in the area around their uh, studio. And that's a game you can play or a thing you can apply to your neighborhood, your, um, the neighborhood where you work, uh, whatever. And uh, in my case, I live in New Orleans. I live in the Lower Ninth Ward of New Orleans. And we happen to live near the river, so there are boat sounds. There's a railroad track, so there are railroad track sounds. There's a drawbridge that I've now learned the pattern of the beeps and what means going up and what means going down. There's a church bell that rings at the wrong time every day. And there's also, a real, and there's bird sounds, um, which I've gotten more interested in lately. But I also know that one of the, my favorite sort of sound features of the neighborhood is my neighbor Peter, who always seems to be holding forth uh, on his front porch when I'm trying to do uh, a radio interview um, in my office. Uh, so another sound-oriented one. Probably you are familiar with John Cage's famous composition, Four Minutes and 33 Seconds, 433, which consisted of someone not playing the piano for four minutes and 33 seconds in front of a live audience. It was not popular, did not go over well the first time it was done, uh, but it has become his most famous piece. And it is often discussed as a piece about silence. That's not really true. It's a piece about the absence of noise, but it is a... Uh, there is always um, something happening that you can listen to, and it redraws a line between what is music and what is noise and what is silence. And um, I actually do this. I like to set my phone timer for four minutes and 33 seconds from time to time when I'm in my office and just need a kind of break um, and just do nothing but listen for four minutes and 33 seconds. Um, and it's interesting, it's an interesting experience. So I thought maybe we could all just, no, we're not gonna do it. But think about how scary it is to think about the idea of us sitting here in silence together for four minutes and 33 seconds and reflect on why it is that that's so scary. Um, but as I say, it's not exactly about silence. It's about, uh, it's about hearing things that you wouldn't have heard otherwise. Um, and in the book, I talk about things with other senses and smell and touch and things like that. Uh, and and to some extent, it gets into the idea of um, what Duchamp called the infrathin, which are these things that are senses that aren't really defined by the five senses, like the feeling of almost touching your, your nose or the feeling of, one of his examples he likes to use is the warmth of a chair that someone was just sitting in as an example of the infrathin. Okay, but before we get too esoteric with this, um, there are practical payoffs to this stuff, I believe, and this gets into the design world. Change is to could be is one of my favorite um, examples in the book and was directly dis inspired by um, a designer named, uh, who calls himself Rotten Apple, who does uh, street work and uh, works under that name because a lot of what he does is not um, legal. Uh, but he is, his whole thing is looking at what's on the street and what it could be converted into. So for example, Here's a bike rack that he's converted into a chair. Um, here's a, you know, t t sort of sad looking <laughs> uh, fire hydrant now converted to, that's a cutting board that he took from the street, refashioned into a um, chess board, and it becomes a little social space. Sometimes he doesn't even make anything, he just sort of points something out, like here's a cross, uh, walk don't walk sign, and he, you can see there's a sticker down there, and it says, oh, this is a good place, you could just, bang out a few pull-ups. So this way of looking doesn't have to be practical. It's just a way of looking at your environment and seeing what could be there that isn't there now. Um, and it can be sort of whimsical. Street artists are tremendously good at this, certain kinds of street artists who, who this is my favorite kind of street artists, who work off the environment and respond directly to the environment. I'm not telling you to go uh, do a lot of graffiti or whatever, but I do think that anyone can learn to look um, at the street this way. And that it's practical and a good exercise that, that leads to you know, potentially productive results. For the book, in addition to just making up a lot of these assignments and taking ideas from artists, I interviewed a bunch of people um, like Dan Ariely, the behavioral psychologist, and Paula Antonelli, the 
MoMA curator, and Seth Godin, who's sort of a business marketing guru guy. He gave me one of my, what turned out to be one of my favorite uh, examples, um, find something to complain about. Complaining gets kind of a bad rap. People are kind of down on complaining. Um, but it's, complaining is not a bad thing. Uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a, if you think about it, you don't really make progress or make change unless you find things to complain about. James Murphy from LCD Sound System did not actually say this, but he said something that was this in spirit, which is that the way his band started is that uh, he got tired of just sitting around with his friends complaining about the music that they wanted to hear and how what they were hearing was so lacking and so uninspiring. And they realized that the thing that they needed to do was start making music themselves. But my favorite thing about the way Seth frames this is that this is not a process of figuring out what everyone else thinks is a problem or what everyone else should be complaining about or what everyone else is complaining about. It's about what you have a problem with. It's a very individual thing. If I think it's broken, it's broken. And I find that uh, kind of inspirational. And in fact, it is not unrelated from a project that I was involved in a few years ago that started out, it started out by noticing um, one of these real estate signs. I'm sure you've seen signs like this that sort of are advertising, here's the new building that's coming here, the really exciting future that's gonna be built any day now. And I realized one day I was walking my dog past this, this was in Savannah, and uh, I realized I'd been walking past this exact same sign for two, three years, and that actually the building itself was for sale so that future that was depicted on that sign was a complete hypothetical. And uh, I thought that was kind of ridiculous. And it inspired this project, me and uh, Ellen Susan and G.K. Darby uh, identified a bunch of these sort of neglected properties around New Orleans. And we worked with a whole bunch of other writers and artists and so on to come up with ridiculous, absurd ideas for what these hypothetical futures could be for these buildings. So in this case, uh, the Museum of the Self. It's a terrible idea, you don't want that. But uh, then we had the signs produced and uh, installed on the buildings. We did not have permission to do this, but no one got hurt. And they became a uh, part of the environment. We did this all over town. And people always wanna say like, well, were you trying to fool people? No, I don't think anybody thought that this was really gonna happen, this Candy Chang uh, project. Um, I'll show you one more. A, a number of them were inspired by, um, you know, kind of comments about other, other elements of city life. I'm a little obsessed with no loitering signs and where they're located and where they're not. So for this building, we decided it would be the no loitering center, uh, a place that's just for loitering. And you can see how that building would work out. Anyway, all the signs were stolen <laughs> within about a week, uh, except for one in a really bad part of town that stood, that stood for two or three years. Uh, but the project itself it was called the Hypothetical Development Organization, ended up being part of the official US presentation at the uh, uh, Venice uh, Biennale of Architecture uh, with a whole bunch of other things about urban intervention. So pretty fun outcome for just like complaining about something, a good example of noticing something letting yourself go with it, and uh, the best way to complain is to make things. It was a rewarding experience. Smaller scale, but similar in thought. I always like to bring this one up, pay attention to the wrong thing. This is kind of the story of my life, um, but a great example of it, uh, I talk a lot in the book about museums and what you're supposed to look at in a museum and how museums are these really particular environments for looking and for attention. and. Uh, who controls them or whatever. But there's this photographer, Stefan Drachan, I think is how it's pronounced. And he does these terrific projects of looking at the wrong thing in museums. And in this case, he has a series, my favorite series of his. He has one that's of people whose uh, clothing kind of matches the art they're looking at. And he has another one called Don't Touch the Art, which is of nothing but people touching the art. But my favorite one is people in museums sleeping. <laughs> Just like the idea of undercutting the authority of this. Uh, Anyway, 
this idea of noticing and attention, it's about, it's partly about building a habit, but it's also very much about breaking habits. Um, and uh, the example I like to use on this is your commute, for those of you who commute. I mean, it's logical that you figure out the most efficient way to get from point A to point B, and that's the way you go. Uh, we're all trying to be efficient, we're all trying to be productive, we're all trying not to waste time, and that makes sense. Uh, the only problem with it is that in a way it makes life go by fast in a way that's sort of, it's productive, but it's also kind of reductive. I have a friend who talks about how she wants in her life to have more nows, and those familiar routes are the opposite of now. It's like a non-time. Um, so I like the idea of just, you know, from time to time, whatever your most efficient route is that you figured out, don't take that route. Take a really inefficient route. Use the bus. Go the wrong way. Go the long way. Walk somewhere that you normally drive. And be open to the uh, moment. And you can apply this. Jim Kudal is a designer in uh, Chicago. You can apply this, as he recommends, not just to something simple like a commute, but just to like anything that you are in a familiar pattern of doing um, to open yourself up to new ways of thinking and to have more nows. Carla mentioned the class. I mentioned the class. Um, when I started out on this, um, I, I used to give students, I still give students an assignment to invent a way to pay attention that's the whole assignment, um, and the point is obviously to see how they resolve it. Uh, I was interested when I started getting responses how many of them involved uh, other people, not really responding to the environment, but responding to other people and listening to other people and talking to strangers and things like this. And honestly, maybe it's because I'm sort of antisocial, but that is not something that had really occurred to me, but they were right that one of the things we could do a better job of paying attention to um, is each other and learning to listen better and learning to be tuned in to other people and what they have to contribute to our lives even when it's not obvious. One of the exercises that Amy Krauss Rosenthal suggested, who I quoted at the beginning of the presentation, uh, it was her and another artist, um, is this idea of the group autobiography. So this is a fun thing that maybe Carla, your class can even do this. Um, the idea is, and I've done this in workshops where you get uh, the groups of five, seven, ten people, and they have 15 minutes, and what they have to do is talk through five things that they all have in common. And it's, um, you know, maybe they're all from California or they're all from whatever. It doesn't really matter what the five things are. And if you give them just a compressed amount of time, they f they're forced to ask each other a lot of questions and get to know each other in a really short period of time. It's fun. My other suggestion for um, connecting with other people kind of draws these things together, observation and connection. Uh, and this is an easy one, it works wherever you go. And it's kind of not unrelated to the Significant ob Objects project that Carla uh, mentioned, which was about thrift store objects that we had invented, we had writers invent stories for. We have, this is Joshua Glenn and I, we have a new series going on now called um, Project Object. Uh, which is nonfiction stories, and we're specifically asking people for their stories of this. It's, we don't frame it this way, but it's often some of the weirdest stuff they own. That just like, why do you have that? And if you're in someone's home and you can see like they've got a really nice vase and a really pretty set of flowers and a really uh, cool whatever Alexa device or something like that, and then like something like this, this is the thing you want to ask about and find out what the deal. Why do you have that? Why is that in your living room? This belonged to Mark Frauenfelder. There's a story about him and his brother and kind of the essence of brotherness. This is Keo Stark, uh, peep show token from when she was growing up in New York City. Uh, I'll tell this story real quick. Um, Kevin Brockmeyer, an excellent writer in Arkansas, uh, has saved this Wendy's toy. This was from a date that he went on in high school. Uh, really liked this girl. They went to a Wendy's and got their dinner and they got the toy and then they went to the movies and they sat down at the movies and he playfully rolled this car through her hair which was an incredibly bad decision because it got all caught up and tangled up and they spent the rest of the evening disentangling her hair and there was no second date. 
Every time I do this talk, I ask myself, will you include the burnt underwear slide? And the answer is always yes. Uh, the story here comes from a radio producer named Kalila Holt. There's a really great podcast called Heavyweight. Uh, and the backstory is, this is from a family trip that she took with her grandmother and her mother, three, three generation trip, and they were staying in a rented apartment somewhere, and for whatever reason they had, they were, they were in a hurry to get going, and the, she, she needed, a, the, the underwear was in the, in the, it wasn't dry, it was in the washer, and the grandmother said, well, let's just throw it in the microwave, <laughs> and um, that doesn't work, that doesn't work. But the amazing thing is that um, the grandmother and the mother thought it was so hilarious that they had this framed. <laughs> and it was in the grandmother's apartment for a while. You don't really need me to tell you that if you ever see a framed underwear, ask a few questions. <laughs> uh, but I like to include that one anyway. So check out Project Object. It's all weird things, and it's based on that idea. And you can do this. I've done this with people at rest. If you're at a restaurant or a small business or at someone's office, and you're kind of at a loss for how to connect, um, look around for the weirdest thing in the room. It's definitely got the best story. So the book moves from looking to sensing to other people, and it kind of ends with the idea of looking inward. The way my editor put it was, you start out looking around and ultimately you look inside. Um, and the last exercise in the book also came from one of my students. Um, and from that assignment of invent a way to pay attention. And he explained when he it came his turn to sort of say what he had invented, he was very apologetic and he said, I think I misunderstood the assignment. I didn't get it right because what I did was I bought a cactus and I took care of it. And I said, yeah, that's not really what I had in mind, but um, in a way, it's exactly right on because you know, attention and what you care about are things that are linked, and you should pay attention to what you care about, and you should care about what you pay attention to. So in a way, he really nailed it and uh, clarified the whole thing for me because uh, what I think is important about this stuff is that it is really, you know, technology things aside, it is important from time to time to tune out the white noise of other people, tr not just trying to get your attention, but kind of judging um, your attention. Uh, because it, it really is true that we've come to live in a time where the saddest thing that I hear is, is from students and just from people is someone will sort of have this sense that, uh, well, I noticed this thing and I think it's interesting, but no one else seems to be paying attention to it, so I guess it's not important. And no, that's the, exactly the opposite is true. It's the things you notice that no one else has noticed yet that are the most important of all. And that's why you need to honor your own curiosity and your own sense of observation and your sense of uh, wonder and your sense of what uh, really matters to you. Because um, ultimately, the things you notice and pay attention to that other people haven't paid attention to yet, um, you should think about maybe those are things that you could draw their attention to as something that deserves to be appreciated or something that needs to be explained or something that ought to be fixed. But even if it's none of those things, even if it's just something that you're paying attention to and no one else is, that's what makes you you. You should honor that and give yourself permission to enjoy it. Okay, so feel free to buy a book. You've been a ter terrific audience. There's a website, uh, there's, on my website, there's a newsletter where I send out stuff about this kind of stuff uh, every week or so. Uh, please check it out. And if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. You have been terrific, thank you. Yes. Um, I see some parallels between the way that you approach noticing and the hypernormal work that um, Francis Fusawa and Dennis Lewis and 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 Sun um, was wondering if what you thought about their work. 
I'm not incredibly conversant in it. I think there are lots of people who have done things. I mean, the book is, and I don't cite them particularly, but I'm definitely not, uh, I, I'm build, trying to build on, I think, a strain of thinking and in the design world, thinking that uh, sort of honoring the iconic and honoring the everyday that um, I think is uh, valuable and kind of deserves wider. I mean, the, the, the main thing I can say about Supernormal is like, not that many people really know about that, so I'm trying to communicate with a, maybe an audience beyond um, the kind of, let's say, you know, rarefied, you know, design art world. Not that there's anything wrong with the rarefied design art world. It's great. Um, but I'm trying to kind of go in a more maybe work a day. These are, a lot of what's in this book is meant very, it's meant to be extremely accessible. You don't have to be that smart. <laughs> that didn't come out right. Um, no, but as smart as those folks are, the super, I mean, that's, because that's like kind of in a particular, I don't know a ton about it, but I feel like it's in a very particular context. Yeah, it's really about design. Yeah, which I, right, which I think, I'm trying to take those kind of ideas and say like, how can you, what can you do tomorrow that will help you appreciate the world the way they appreciate the world, which, which is admirable, you know, definitely. Others? Yes. Um, this is kind of like a comment to also maybe a question. Sure. Um, we were uh, talking about sort of critical thinking um, in the art industry, and we, we had this discussion between sort of the perspectives on different things of art, like when you see Jane Seymour, and the sort of high end critics can be very forbidding, and people can have like their own ideas about things that aren't necessarily the same from the normal perspective. Yeah, I don't know that I've had exactly that kind of conversation with exactly that kind of person. In the, I talked to a lot of artists in the process of putting this together, and there were some theory-based discussions um, that, to be honest, I didn't pursue particularly far for reasons I was just saying. Like it's. I honor that stuff. It's not who I'm trying to talk directly to. And I feel like, I guess I'm of the school where, Stephen Hawking had this line once where he said that, uh, that when he was writing The Brief History of Time that like every, someone told him every formula you include in the book cuts your readership in half. <laughs> so I, I'm always mindful of that kind of thing, like every, Everything that I would put into a book, I feel like it has to, if it has to, this is kind of more of a discussion of the philosophy of writing. Like, it depends on what I'm trying to communicate and what value I think I'm giving to the reader. So a lot of names get mentioned in the book, but I'm not trying to, so if people want to pursue uh, George Nelson or someone like that, then they can. But if they don't, then they don't have to. Um, so I don't know if that comes anywhere close to answering your question, but it's it's something I thought about, but I, I'm thinking about it in a particular way. Does that close, close enough? <laughs> okay. Who else? I thought I saw another hand. Maybe not. All right. Well, thanks for coming. <laughs>